Thank you so much. Absolutely perfect. I, I, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for, for being here. Um, many of you have contributed to us reaching this day, and um, today we're here to launch what I think is a decisive force in making sure that people with mental illness get a fair deal, that they get an equal access and quality in our health system, the same as they get for their physical health. They currently don't get that. They don't get that. And, and I want to say, even though Jessica's just told, told you that I'm a clinician and a researcher and everything, but I'm here not, not in any of those forms today, and that's why I've, I've been involved with the great people that have been preparing for this launch of Australians for Mental Health, because I'm a family member as well. In my family, in the heart of my family, there's mental illness and addiction. And that came on later in life, in my case, long after I went into mental health. But that is the motivating force now that really drives me to be part of my friendships with the people here today, with all of you. This is an inclusive process. We are not trying to score political points in any shape or form here. We would hate to see that happen with this movement. It's a mass movement of every Australian person, especially the four million who are affected every year and their families, which is almost everybody. I don't we leave anyone out, really, do we? So this has got to be inclusive, and it's serious. We can't keep waiting around for this to be dealt with, because people's lives are at stake. So we're going to tell you about a new movement called Australians for Mental Health, why it's necessary, and how we aim to engage and mobilise an alliance of millions of Australians with mental illness and the families, and to support the very genuine efforts of our political leaders and representatives who, many of whom are here and who have tried their very best to, to tackle this issue. I know that from personal experience over the last 10 or 15 years. And they need our support if there's going to be a sea change. Otherwise, all they can do is a bit here, a bit there, an incremental improvement. We've seen that for the last 20 years. And then in the case of state governments, we've seen them going backwards. So, you know, that's not good enough. It's, it's not enough. It wouldn't be acceptable in cancer or heart disease. That mass support we're trying to mobilise now is taken for granted when it comes to cancer and heart disease. Governments wouldn't dare neglecting those areas. They would not survive if they did not do that. But why is it that we, that we can just keep on going like this with this level of neglect? And this is not to criticise anyone. I'm not here to blame a single person here today for this. We've got to look forward into the future. We've had a tantalising feeling that we're on the cusp of something like a sea change for many years. But it's often like a mirage that just slips out of, out of reach. Last week, we, we saw James Packer step down from the board of Crown Resort Resorts and with great honesty acknowledged that this was due to mental illness. We've seen prominent sports people and politicians disclose before, but Mr. Packer is one of the very first top business leaders to do so. And in doing that, he's shown not just courage, but leadership. It's leadership to do that. It's showing what needs to be done. And we hope he'll encourage many others. But it does add to that sense that we're on the, we're on the verge of a breakthrough. And, uh, and are we? If, if we look at the state of play, if you listen to the, the stories, you're going to hear some more very tragic stories in a minute. But um, what is really happening? How are we actually responding to this rising tide? Well, <clears throat> I probably don't need to quote all the stats at you. You know them all. 3,000 people dying every year from preventable deaths from suicide. 30 more attempts for every single one of those suicides and etc etc four million of us affected but no one can deny whether we whether we want to use the term broken system or system that's not built to scale whatever way no one can deny that people who most need expert mental health, mental health care still lack access to it it's a fact and if they get access it's not necessarily quality care as you just heard from, from Rachel. You know, you think when you get in the door of a cancer centre, you're probably going to get the best quality of care. You can't assume that in mental health, sadly. So quality is important. But why is this? Well, you know, you can, you can say it's about the money, and some, it's not just about the money, but the money is important. The burden of disease is nearly 15% in this society from mental illness. But we're spending a bit over 5% of the health budget. And that means that two out of three people, and I know this from Victorian data, two out of three people with serious mental illness will be turned away from that expert care. Two out of three, 15%, 5%, it all adds up. So money is, 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 is the way that we need to solve the problems. It will take time. We're not expecting it to be solved in this budget or even you know, in the next year or two, but 
we've got to commit to doing that. Now, we know that we've had multiple national inquiries that all come to the same conclusion. We need a new approach, a new financial model. And federal governments have become more engaged in this issue in the last 15 years. I, I think that's fair to say. We've seen genuine progress during the Howard government with better access and headspace, and, and some very innovative programs during um, the Gillard government with Mark Butler, who, who very fortunately is here today. I think, um, you know, there's no shortage of goodwill from health ministers and mental health ministers. It's the whole of government that hasn't really signed up for this uh, at this day. And we need all sides of politics to do that, not just the poor old health minister or, he or mental health minister. The current health minister, he's not able to be with us today, but we've just met with him. He's got a deeply personal commitment, just like Jessica has, just like I have, just like our speakers have. And we know he's sincere. It's mental health is one of his key priorities. He's been trying to introduce new initiatives. Julie Collins and Deborah O'Neill and uh, are both here too. We know that they're equally committed. So it, it's it's not the problem of the commitment of the ministers or the shadow ministers. That's not the problem. It's not even the problem of the government. The government can't act unless we show the public, the Australian public, show that they care about this as much as they care about cancer and heart disease. The National Mental Health Commission has designed an incredibly good step care model. Um, the chair, uh, Lucinda Brogdon, is here today. Thank you for coming. Um, it's still aspirational, though. It's still aspirational. Beyond primary care, those other steps are not there. You try to climb up the ladder, and there's about three or four missing steps, and you fall right down. It's a shared responsibility. We're not here to harangue federal governments alone here. We want to see state governments. We've got the, we've got the evidence that state governments have been disinvesting, actually, in real terms, in, 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 the, in expert services. They used to do some things better than they do now, like mobile crisis teams and assertive outreach. They don't do that anymore. You've got to go to the emergency department, the sausage factory of the emergency department. So we need those, those steps put in that matter. State governments, as I said, cashed in their, their beds 15, 20 years ago. They promised they'd build an assertive, strong community mental health system. It lasted about five minutes. I, I remember it. I worked in it. It was working very well in, in the early days. It just disappeared. So we have this large cohort of people, like the missing middle we call them. Too complex for primary care, not desperately ill enough for acute care. It's grown exponentially, but they've been largely abandoned. And add, add in huge population growth. Anthony Byrne, you know about that, don't you? In your growth corridors. And you've got a perfect storm. Preventable deaths, incarceration rates have increased substantially. And public safety even has been compromised. We're reluctant to talk about that in mental health, but there's no doubt that people untreated can pose a risk in, in a small number of cases. So, ambulance is at the bottom of the cliff. Countless personal stories of, of tragedies. Some, some of my friends are here today to tell their stories, but you'll hear thousands, hundreds of thousands of these stories if you care to listen. So we need to invest a lot more, and we need to do it in new ways. So why don't we? Why don't we? It's a paradox, isn't it? We've got a health problem that, that serious, and it's not, it's not really tackled seriously. We've got awareness coming out of our ears these days. Stigma's less, and we have effective treatments, and we've, we've got dramatically much better return on, on investment than any other area of the health sector. I'll just give you one example. I've worked in early psychosis, early intervention psychosis for, for 20 odd years. It's one of the su success stories internationally of psychiatry. You get a return on investment for every dollar you spend there of $12. So you don't even have to spend any money. You're going to save money if you do these things. There's no doubt. The evidence is, is absolutely clear, but we're still not doing it. We don't, we're doing it in six places, thanks to Mark Butler in Australia, and that's been continued by the present government. Um, it's only in six locations in the whole country. So mental health care is the best buy in the health system by a mile. But we don't fund things on the basis of cost effectiveness in health. We don't fund cancer on that basis. Cancer is not funded because it's cost effective. It's, it's, the, last, it's the least cost effective thing to fund, actually. We fund it because it, you have to do it. You have to save lives when you, when you can. You have to help people recover if you've got the means to do it. And we're just not doing it well enough. So <clears throat> I just want to state again that Australians of Mental Health is not about blaming people. It's about the future, it's about inclusiveness and about supporting our politicians to help us as the public. So what's the missing piece? Well, 
The missing piece is the 4 million Australians with mental ill health, and particularly those 700,000 with, se with severe and complex mental illnesses, and their families do not really have a real voice. And that's not to criticise the existing organisations. I mean, we've had tremendous support from Mental Health Australia, from SANE, from Beyond Blue, from um, Butterfly, from everybody else. I've probably left out a, a number of people here, but the sector is completely behind this initiative of Australian Mental Health. It's complementary to what you have been doing. You've been advocating as best you can and, 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 uh, and very effectively, but we, we need a mass voice. That's what this is about. It's the voice of ordinary Australians, not just a small number of people campaigning like we have been for 20 years, all of us, but ordinary Australians. If they do find their voice, this will greatly assist our political leaders in their genuine efforts to build the system that we need. And that's why this has been established as a new grassroots movement to unlock that voice and put it on steroids. That's what we aim to do. The aim is to s sustain a standing campaign nationally and at every election, state and federal. And that we're not just focusing federally, we're focusing at state level as well. Um, we want to inspire and engage all of the four million Australians and their families and all of our political representatives, state and federal, in this opportunity. And we want to empower the political leaders to give mental health care the priority it, it needs to really strengthen our society and safeguard what the Prime Minister calls our mental wealth. Mental wealth means if you look after people with mental illness properly, they will contribute incredibly to our society. And you've just heard um, one beautiful example already, so and you're going to hear more. So what do we want? What do, we, what do Australians for mental health want? We want to see every Australian able to receive the same quality of health care for their mental health as for their physical health. We want a financial model that enables the missing steps in the ladder of care to be put in place. This means a different kind of inquiry, not another fifth mental, me, mental, health, plan, mental health plan or sixth mental health plan. We've had a hundred of them. This, this is a different type of inquiry, which is something like involving the Productivity Commission, as Alan Fells has proposed. And this has come from the Commission, I think, and it's a very, very good idea. We need something serious that's going to create a model that enables this care to be funded. But currently, it's, it's, not, it's not possible to see how it could be done until this, is, this actually occurs. We need accessible and holistic community care in regional hubs, in metropolitan and rural and regional locations, which will integrate high-quality psychosocial, mental health and physical health care with social programs such as housing, employment and, and uh, other vocational services. And they have to be accessible and stigma free. And they have to be, have the expertise. It can't just be a bunch of people supporting each other, as valuable as that is. It, it has to be expertise uh, as well. And with transitions to acute and residential care. So we want clear pathways um, and we want prevention and early intervention to be at, at, at the centre of it too. Finally, a confident and relentless national voice through Australians for Mental Health, supporting political leadership across the political spectrum and across the federal state divide, sustained through the, the next wave of elections is, going, is our missing force. Now, before I finish, I know I've talked way too long, I'm sorry. But <laughs> I just want to thank some, some people because um, this just didn't happen overnight. This idea was born uh, around, let's say, 2010, 2011, when we realised what power there might be in, in large-scale movements and voices in this space. And uh, so I want to thank a few, I'll probably let people out, but the, the ones that I remember were Sam McQueen, Claire Vickery, John Mendoza, Jane Burns and Ian Hickey, in particular. We had a number of very generous donors. We've had a couple of goes at launching this earlier, um, at state level uh, in particular, and um, uh, we've had donors that have helped us. Dick Smith has been extremely generous. He's the kind of person that goes with his heart and his impulses, and this is a good impulse. Wilson Asset Management, Jane Keel, Jeff Brown, Eleni Sakalis, and crowdfunding has been helpful as well, believe it or not. For campaign design support, I want to thank originally Think HQ and Anna Spraggett, and more recently, Essential Media and Brad Chilcott, who's helped us really in an incredible way to get this organised today, so very professionally done. Organisations, I mentioned that the, 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 the major uh, peak bodies and NGOs in the space, I did mention uh, that Headspace is also supportive, Butterfly. Um, I believe the president of the College of Psychiatrists, Kim Jenkins, is here. Oh, sorry, I can see it. 
and I'm, I'm very grateful for, for you for being, for being here because our profession hasn't always been 100% supportive of these things. So we are so grateful for you. Things are changing. Yeah, things are changing. The new president. <laughs> Great. So thank you, Kim. And um, because psychiatry has to be, you know, I, I, I went into psychiatry because it was different. It was humane. It was it cared about people in a holistic way. And, and um, we have to be at the centre of this. The AMA, um, Simon Tass is here from the AMA, and Michael Gannon and Tony Bartoni have been incredibly supportive of what we're trying to do as well, which is great, that's very powerful to have the medical profession supporting us in this way. We've had great pro bono support from, originally from Grant Thornton, actually, um, and George Viapas originally, and Clayton Utes, our, our pro bono lawyers, have, have helped us to get DGR status, and thanks to one of our key board members, Lisa Sweeney, she put in a huge amount of work there too. We've got great board members, um, and, and they've all had lived experience, and we'll hear from some of them. Anthony Byrne, I mentioned him already. He, he was our early champion. He, he helped us launch um, uh, Strange for Mental Health a few years ago when we were probably just um, what's the word, infants rather than teenagers. Um, and so thank you, Anthony. John Brogdon, he's been a, a very um, deep uh, and sincere supporter of ours as well, again from lived experience, and he knows what we're talking about. And um, I've probably left out a lot of people, I apologise if I have, but I'll probably better stop talking. I just want to thank you all and uh, have a good day.